All right, folks, so our new topic is equilibria, and we'll be, we've already talked about this some. Uh, we backed into it sort of when we went from, when we're talking about acids and bases, and we started talking about weak acids and weak bases, because those exist in equilibria, in, um, the, in equilibrium, the weak acid will be, will be in equilibrium with its conjugate base, or weak base will be in equilibrium with its conjugate acid. And so we've, we have some of these concepts down already, but there are some details we need to go back and pick up. And we're going to go into uh, different types of equilibria after this. So here's sort of a, a starter lesson on equilibria. Equilibrium, um, and is by the way, you'll remember when whenever we represented chemical reactions that that were equilibrium systems, we represented them as equations with two directions of with arrows with two directions or two-way arrows uh, between reactants and products. So we're going to be referring to a forward reaction and a reverse reaction here. So here we go with this definition on the page in front of us. Equilibrium is a situation reached when the rate or speed of the forward reaction equals the rate or speed of the reverse reaction. So this situation will only ever be reached in a closed system. That means in a closed system. Remember, a system is something uh, that we define as being what we're testing or experimenting on or what we're observing. The system, we just decide, we choose what will be the boundaries that we're considering. Uh, what we'll call our system is what's inside the boundary we choose and everything else is outside the system. Uh, when people talk about this idea of system, say in, ther in uh, thermodynamics, which we've not gotten into yet, they will describe what you're considering, which is your system, that's everything inside the boundary you've chosen. And then outside the boundary, they will call that the universe. So you have a system and universe, right? Everything else other than the system. So, okay, a closed system, which would be a, the with everything within the boundary that we've chosen to observe or experiment upon, a closed system would be one in which no matter can, can come in through the boundary or go out through the boundary. Okay, many of our situations are not closed systems, um, but if you want a, uh, an equilibrium reaction to actually reach equilibrium, uh, then it's going to have to, it, it, it cannot be continually gaining or losing one of the materials, one or more of the materials that participate in the equilibrium. So this would be like a sealed container, maybe. Or there's a close approximation to a closed system when you just have a solution, a water solution of uh, dissolved solids, things that, that were added to it in solid form and become aqueous when they dissolve. So um, in any case, this is sort of a technical definition. And we're going to look at a graph that uh, kind of elaborates on this. So here's our graph. It's for a particular equilibrium system. Uh, <clears throat> this is the title at the, of the graph at the top. Changes in reaction rates for the forward and reverse reactions for this equation. So this equation, this chemical system is the reaction of water with carbon monoxide gas to produce hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide gas. And you can see this is a reversible reaction, meaning the forward reaction happens, and then as products are made, the backwards reaction happens. And so, um, and these are once once things get started, both of them, both re forward and reverse reactions will continue. Now, notice on our graph we have reaction rates as the that's the parameter. That's what we're uh, plotting on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have time so it's reaction rate versus time each of the data points on this blue line is the speed or rate of reaction at that time for 
the forward reaction, which is water reacting with carbon monoxide. <clears throat> Each of the data points in, that make up this red line is the speed or rate of reaction of carbon dioxide with hydrogen gas, that's the reverse reaction, um, at a particular time after the after the start after we've started our experiment notice that the reaction rate for the forward reaction is decreasing until we reach this dashed line this vertical dashed line and then it holds steady as this black line but notice in contrast that the red line is steadily it's zero at at time zero meaning at the very beginning when we let the reaction start. When we start out with just water and carbon monoxide, uh, at the very beginning there's zero of the reverse reaction rate. Um, and that makes sense because there's zero hydrogen gas. There's no concentration of hydrogen gas. There's no concentration of carbon dioxide gas. So that, that backwards reaction can't happen without its participants being available to react with each other. Okay, so Notice that its rate is getting greater and greater. It's increasing. The speed of that reaction is increasing as time goes by until we, again, hit that dashed line, the vertical dashed line on the graph. And then, it, then the line has a constant slope of zero. And so the reaction rate doesn't change for the f reverse reaction from that dashed line to the right. So what is this? This is telling us, this is implying many things, and we need to try to pick up on those implications. Maybe I'll start with the red line for the reverse reaction, because it made so much sense that our, we should have a zero speed for the rate of reaction of hydrogen gas with carbon dioxide at the very beginning. And that makes sense because we have zero concentration or zero molecules even of H2 and zero molecules of CO2 formed at that point. So they obviously can't react and the reaction rate is going to be zero. Well, <clears throat> what we're seeing is as time goes by, the, the reverse reaction speeds up. And why would that be? Well, it's because uh, we're getting increased concentrations as time goes by. We're getting e increased concentrations of hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide. Why? Because they're being formed by the forward reaction as time goes by. Well, it turns out that chemical reactions happen when chemical species collide with each other, when atoms or molecules run into each other, crash into each other in, in, in actual space. In reality, they hit each other. That's when reactions can happen. Remember, chemical reactions are, uh, they involve gain, loss, or sharing of electrons. And that and that means they involve breaking of chemical bonds and forming of new chemical bonds. And so this only happens when atoms or molecules collide with each other. That's when they can transfer electrons or begin to have new sharings of electrons. And that is also to say that's when bonds can be broken and formed. Old bonds can be broken, new bonds can be formed. And... Um, <clears throat> So if it if how fast the reaction happens depends on how much opportunity there is for the things to crash into each other then it makes sense that as the react as the concentrations of H2 and CO2 increase there's more chance for them to crash into each other if this is all in some confined volume if they can't be escaping so that means if it's in a closed system so if there if as we build up concentration of H2 and CO2 if that gives them more opportunity to crash into each other then it makes sense that that reverse reaction should be happening faster as the concentrations build up and in the same way uh, or I should say conversely as reaction goes along and we're using up H2O and CO there are fewer and fewer of those molecules in the confined space the closed system there are fewer and fewer of them, and so there's less and less opportunity for them to be crashing into each other, which means that they, the reaction rate should be slowing down. And indeed, that's what we see. We see the reaction rate is decreasing. It's getting smaller. We're going 
that forward reaction is getting slower and slower and slower until we hit this dashed line. All right. What's going on at the dashed line? Well, <clears throat> that's a marker for when the system reaches equilibrium. The system reaches equilibrium at whatever time this is that's marked by the dashed line. The other evidence that it's reached equilibrium is that the forward reaction rate doesn't change from that point on, and the reverse reaction rate doesn't change from that point on, and they're equal, which means they're equal means that um, you know whenever we use up a water molecule and a carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide molecule to make a hydrogen gas molecule and a CO2 molecule um, at the same time as that forward reaction happened and in the same sp amount of uh, with the same speed a carbon dioxide molecule is crashing into a hydrogen molecule and reacting to form a carbon monoxide molecule and an H2O molecule which is the reverse reaction so in effect, water is not getting used up, CO's carbon monoxide is not getting used up, hydrogen gas is not getting used up, and CO2 is not getting used up, and so their concentrations seem to be not changing. Now, is, we might be led to believe, that might lead us to believe that there's no reaction going on, but this is actually a dynamic equilibrium where both the forward reaction is going on and the backward reaction go, is going on and since they're, they're they've got equal and opposite rates or if, if, since they've got equal rates but they're in opposite directions they cancel each other's effect and that's why we have this steady rate in both cases and actually that's also why we can always if we just keep on checking concentrations after the system has reached equilibrium we'll find it's not changing. We've got the same amount every time we check. All right.